Hey everybody, we've made it to week 11 of my series, Journey to Marvel's Infinity War. Each week in 2018, I'm gonna re-review one movie in the MCU leading up to Infinity War. At least that was my original plan, and then they moved Infinity War forward a week about a week ago. So one of these weeks, I'm gonna have to double up so I can cover all the movies and watch the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, talk about it, analyze it, discuss it with you guys down in the comment section, leading up to this iconic event movie coming out at the very end of April now, not at the beginning of May. Anyway, today we are talking about Avengers Age of Ultron. For me, this is a this is an interesting one. It's kind of very divisive because some people absolutely love it, some people hate it, and a lot of people are right there in the middle kind of confused by it. They're like, it has really high highs, it has really low lows. A lot of different emotions about this one. If you're new to this series, the way it works, I'm gonna review the movie. I'm gonna talk about the good, the mixed, the bad. Uh, I'm also gonna talk about the MCU connections. I'm gonna share some other people's takes on the movie using the Stardust app. But the key thing is I wanna have a great discussion about this movie. So join me down in the comment section. Tell me your thoughts on it. What do you love? What do you hate? All that fun, exciting stuff. With that said, let's get started. We'll kick things off talking about the good, and the best thing about this movie is that it's just so much fun to spend more time with this batch of characters with that Joss Whedon dialogue in these types of scenarios. From all the previous movies, we of course know that these characters are great. The incredible thing that Joss Whedon was able to do in his two Avengers movies is demonstrate they have incredible chemistry when they're together. And Joss Whedon is a master of just having tension within the scenes, creating just funny dialogues, the quips, all group dynamics, that's his sweet spot. That's what he did on television for 15 years and he brings that to these movies and with such an amazing skill set. That, that Just throughout the movies, there's so many different scenes that are just iconic. Whether you're talking about the funny scenes where they're trying to lift up the hammer, whether you're talking about Tony and uh, Steve debating the politics of what they're trying to do and what the end result is as they're chopping logs and both of them are getting frustrated with the other person's worldview. Whatever you're talking about, he's great at bringing the best out of these characters, whether the fun side or the dramatic side, pulling out their different worldviews. Joss Whedon is a master at that sort of thing. Some of the best lines of dialogue in the entire MCU are in this movie. Like there's one where Wanda's talking about Ultron and she says, you know, he doesn't know the difference between saving the world and ending it. Where do you think he gets that from? That's such a great comment on both Ultron, his origins, as well as of course talking about Tony Stark. And it has such depth to it. That's an amazing line. And there's so many of those sprinkled throughout this entire movie as it just, just wonderful stuff that he is so good at crafting those types of lines. And the reason that these lines land so well and have such depth to them is the movie has very deep themes woven throughout the entire thing. Very early on, we establish kind of this conflict where we have Tony who wants to end the war. He doesn't want to keep having to be a superhero. And this is in conflict with some of the other people that Steve is a soldier for life, he doesn't have anything else to do, and he's highly skeptical of any sort of authoritarian government thing running everything. These are very powerful ideas that run throughout this movie that set up Civil War so well, and that's kind of what makes these lines of dialogues work because we're exploring ideas, we're exploring these characters and what make them tick. What do they actually want, and why would that come in conflict with each other, even though Everybody wants to save the world. Even Ultron wants to save the world. They just have incredibly different ideas on what that looks like. And the dialogue is kind of what brings a lot of that up so we understand where they're coming from. And these great themes and great dialogue set up amazing internal conflict within the team itself. Multiple times throughout the movie, they have to pause and debate what they're doing and why they're doing it. Because Tony Stark absolutely believes in this idea that, yeah, we should be able to retire at some point in time and having some sort of a, like force that's not us saving the world, that's a good thing. And several others 
really don't think they should do that. And they use this movie as evidence later in the movie as Tony tries to do it a second time. And all of it, you fully understand where they're coming from and why they would have such wildly different ideas on what they should and shouldn't do. And it creates this strong conflict, not just in the big scope of Ultron's trying to destroy the world, but inside individual scenes, there's a specific intention that each character has that comes in conflict with the other characters, even though the big picture intent, they all are on the same page in a certain sense. And that's when you have a movie that's very character based and also at the same time very thematically rich in powerful so you can have amazing moments that, with real emotion to them. The movie also does a great job of setting up individual moments. Like, for example, one of the best moments in the entire movie is when Vision is trying to give his speech as to why am I a monster? Can I help you? And then he just casually makes this gesture and you're not quite sure what he's doing and then it cuts to him lifting up Thor's hammer and handing it to Thor. And because of this gesture, everyone like, all right, we can trust this guy now. And there's a great little quip from Thor. This scene works and is so powerful and it gets a laugh, but it's also emotionally satisfying. It also makes sense as to why now the team would trust him because a totally different scene earlier in the movie sets it up. This iconic scene where they're trying to lift up Thor's hammer, that scene works in and of itself. You're not watching that thinking, oh, they're just setting up something later. No, no, it just works. It's just a great moment in the movie by itself. But even better, in the context of the whole movie, it sets up an important moment leading up into the climax of the movie that has great character depth to it. That is mastercraft right there when a director writer can set up the moment so well and you don't know it when it's happening. In and of itself, the original moment, the setup works right there and then it makes things better as it goes along. And this movie does that whether with individual scenes, with character moments, with the themes, with the jokes, so often, so well. With that said, this movie has some things that are a little bit more mixed, so let's move on to the mixed aspects. Speaking of setting things up, this movie does a very mixed bag of setting up future Marvel movies. So there's really kind of two big movies that this sets up. The first up is Civil War, which I think it does a masterful job setting up Civil War, and then Thor Ragnarok, which does a terrible job there. And what I mean by that is in and of itself, this movie appropriately has conflict between Tony and Steve. You're seeing their different worldviews. Their actions have consequences in the context of this movie, but that's also where Civil War picks up. When they're having those conversations, debates happening in this movie, it doesn't feel like, oh, this is just setting up where we're going. This doesn't need to be here. No, in the context of this movie, it's fully appropriate for them to be having those specific discussions. But in the context of where things are going, it's even more powerful because of that. Likewise, the actions in this movies affect the world of the MCU, which sets up once again, Zemo in Civil War, as well as the Sokovia Accords, all that fun stuff that we get in Civil War. It makes sense as an extension of this movie, while this movie making sense in and of itself. That's great setup. On our other side, we've got the Thor Ragnarok stuff that just felt really forced. It doesn't feel like we have to have Thor going off to a hot tub and getting visions of the Infinity Stones and hearing that, oh no, they're all gonna die in these post-apocalyptic visions. It doesn't work in this movie. This movie gives a reason for why those moments happen, but it doesn't fit this story. It's unfocused, and we'll get into that in a little bit. That's not the good way. So, but this movie both has two different examples of setting up future movies. One I think is great, and one I think is very, very not so great. Another mixed thing in this movie was the death of Quicksilver, that on the one hand, I appreciate someone dying. I appreciate that if they're gonna go to war, if they're gonna do stuff like this, someone has to die eventually. And so you got Coulson in the previous film and they kind of cheated that one. And in this one, it's Quicksilver. And I think as for his arc in and of itself, they gave us, um, if you felt it, you felt kind of like this was an earned moment where the banter back and forth with Hawkeye. And so it made sense what was kind of happening here. And so it was a good moment in that sense. In another sense, it felt like they knew they had to have someone die and they chose kind of the easiest person they could possibly have die. It feels like they just took the easiest way so that they could say, hey, see, people die in our movies, 
but you didn't, it, it's not like it, they set up it, even in, throughout the movie that Hawkeye was going to die. They established themes, ideas, his wife, all this stuff that sets up for a really powerful, he goes back, he's like, I know I'm going to die, but I got to save this kid. And you have this moment where you're like, oh, they're going to kill Hawkeye. Oh no. And then they and even the Quicksilver gets shot up and he goes, didn't see that coming. Even makes a joke. It's a little bit meta the way the line works in it. And it, I felt like they were taking the easy way out of killing someone that would feel a little bit more weight to it as the person died. And the other mixed thing in this one was Ultron himself. In the one sense, he's so menacing, sinister, evil, because his plan is to kill mankind so that we can have peace. That's pretty messed up. And also, likewise, in his backstory, the idea that he's, you know, the, the Frankenstein monster from... Tony Stark's wacky mind and all of the faults that Tony has are fed into the creation of Ultron as well as the character of Ultron. That's so interesting as kind of this weird son of Tony Stark. Um, all that's fascinating. Great contrast in the team as an actual menace, as a character that views what they're doing as a good thing. All sorts of great things in the way all that plays out. The reason he's mixed to me is, is kind of really two sorts of reasons. First off, is they made the decision to give him Tony Stark's personality, a James Spader version of Tony Stark. But I think that undercuts some of the tension of it. For example, going into about the third act of the movie, the twins discover Ultron, he's really, really evil. Ultron realized, oh, they're gonna turn on me, man, I gotta set this right. And so he just starts shooting people and he starts making quips like, oh, come on guys, it'll be okay. It's saying stuff like that. And he does something truly horrific, which is murder a bunch of people in cold blood without even thinking about it for a second. But the tension of the moments, the sinisterness of it is undercut because you've got charismatic, fun, charming James Spader quipping. And so there could have been a moment there where he's just horrifying. And there's all throughout the whole movie, there's little gestures where he does something that just he casually cuts Claw's arm off and stuff. And he, he doesn't, we don't have the pause for the horror of what he's doing. The other one is because of the way the story sort of unfolds and because he's kind of quipping and joking and they didn't have enough establishing him as truly evil earlier on in the movie, it doesn't feel like there's a, a strong enough sense of urgency with his plan to kill all of mankind until we really get to the third act. And if there'd been more sort of things earlier in the movie where it's very clear, like he kills 80 people at something because he just doesn't care. And something like that that's just horrifying that makes us go, oh, that's what I think the movie needed to truly show how bad he is and to go that extra mile. That, that was lacking for me. With that said, let's move on to the negative aspects of this movie. And this is where this one gets really confusing because on paper, if you just gave me a summary of the plot of this movie, I would say that's a great second Avengers movie. But then when you watch the movie, I don't think the movie's great. It's just good. It's a good, enjoyable movie. And that comes down to the storytelling here is so overcrowded, so confusing, so much is happening, and it's so unfocused that the end result is not nearly as good as the big idea or the individual moments. I would easily say of all the movies in the MCU, this one is the most confusing. This is the one where I've had to look at the Wikipedia page to fully understand what's happening. And the whole movie is like that. It gives us too much information, introduces too many characters with too little setup, and moves on to the next thing too fast, which leaves the audience a little bit confused. You get the gist of what's happening. You get the general idea so you can move through it and have fun with the adventures, the quips, the action sequences. In which case, you've got a movie that as you're watching it, it's difficult to figure out what you're supposed to be paying attention to because things kind of keep happening. For example, you have the intro sequence where they attack Hydra. We learn as it's going on, we're trying to get the uh, Loki scepter and then Iron Man goes into this main sequence and then Wanda walks out and puts him into kind of dream world where he's envisioning the invasion from the first Avengers movie and kind of wigging out a little bit. And then it kind of ends the scene with him putting the Iron Man glove on to go grab the scepter. And it, we're seeing from a distance that Wanda's talking there with Quicksilver about what's going on. 
And as you're watching it, you're like, okay, so is this about dream sequence stuff? Is she, is he grabbing the scepter to give it to them? What What is about to happen? And then it just cuts to the title card, Avengers Age of Ultron. It's a very confusing way that like you're focusing in on what, what is the most important thing happening in the sequence? And then it cuts to Tony and Banner are talking about, hey, I looked inside the scepter. There's this stone inside of there. This stone has an artificial intelligence inside of it. We can use it to create Ultron. And then they talk 30 seconds back and forth was where they should do this. And then it does a montage of them working for a few days. They go to a party and it sh shows to one scene of a computer saying integration has happened. We have a scene at a party and then Ultron shows up at the party. That's so fast. That is so much information. Everything I just said is so incredibly loaded. And when you do that, it confuses the audience. And so in screenwriting, there's a tension between do you tell them too much information or do you tell them too little information? They're confused. You can confuse them or you can tell them things they already want to know. You don't want to do either one. You want to be right there in the middle. This movie definitely doesn't tell us enough information or tells us way too fast. And as I've mentioned, the main story here, I think is very strong. Ultron in and of itself works as a story, but it felt like they had to, they had this laundry list of things they wanted. We want to set up Ragnarok. We want to set up Civil War. We want to have Hulk and Hulkbuster fight. And because of that, they had to come up with a plot device to make this happen. And the one they came up with was Scarlet Witch is going to be able to do mind powers on stuff, put visions inside their head and bring out their greatest fears. To give us all this laundry list of things, we now have to add these two characters into the movie. So we have to give them a backstory inside the movie. We have to give them a character arc inside of the movie. We have to give them a redemptive arc inside of the movie so that we can add a fight with the Hulk and Iron Man so that we can have a dream sequence. That's a lot to add to a movie. A lot, especially a movie that already has a large ensemble cast. And we have to establish Ultron and create Ultron. And in doing so, you can see where this movie just got overcrowded and overstuffed really fast. And when you're jumping through the twins and Ultron's creation and the worldview, all these different characters, the redemption arc, that's the main big issue with this movie is they tried to do too much. So there you have it, a very frustrating movie for me because it's got great entertainment value. The chemistry of the cast is great. Individual moments are amazing. Some of the dialogue is fantastic. There's deep themes throughout. And then the way all that's packaged together is very jumbled, cluttered, and genuinely confusing at times. But if I were to score this one, I would give it a B and say it's an 8.5 on the entertainment meter. It's a movie that delivers on the most important aspects while fumbling on some of the storytelling. But what it has to get right, it does get right, and it certainly delivers on entertainment, great moments, iconic shots, uh, laugh out loud little quips, and there's some great setup and payoff moments. With that said, let's move on to the MCU connections and this movie being an Avengers movie, setting up multiple future movies. I'm going to miss a whole bunch of the connections because there's so many little things going on here that are references back to the past as well as set up for the future. So go ahead and tell me your favorites down below. I'm going to list off as many of the ones that I can, which is a little bit tricky because there's so much going on in this movie. Right off the bat, this opening sequence is just jam-packed with stuff. So, our Avengers are attacking a Hydra base, which is a continuation of Winter Soldier that we now understand Hydra's out there, Hydra's infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D., and so they're trying to take all this stuff down, all the remaining pieces. So we've got this Hydra base that's got the guy that was in the post credit sequence with the twins from Winter Soldier, and he's got Loki's scepter, so we've got multiple references in that. Back to what's happening, this scepter has magic powers that they've been using to test on people to try and give them powers, which gives us the twins, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, which is also, once again, very important. Once the Avengers defeat um, this group of people, they take the scepter back to their base. Bruce and Tony starts looking into it and they discover some stone inside of it, some stone that might have some amazing powers. They look inside of it and discover an artificial intelligence and Tony decides, as Tony often does, to use that to power his Ultron pro project and uses that artificial intelligence inside of this powerful stone to make that happen. 
as the movie goes along, we have some visions that happen because Scarlet Witch gets inside of people's head. And so in there, uh, Peggy Carter shows up talking to Captain America. Iron Man gets thrown back into his nightmares, his PTSD, all that stuff that came out of the original Avengers movie. Thor gets his apocalyptic vision that everybody's going to die, and this sets him off on his own little adventure to discover what's going on, so he jumps into a hot dog, uh, I was about to say hot dog, which would have been funny, but instead jumps into this hot tub thing, gets a new vision of uh, the Thanos Infinity Gauntlet, the Infinity Stones, he gains all this information, and in this we learn that inside of Loki's scepter was the Mind Stone, and it is what powered everything Loki was doing, it's the thing that gave the twins their power, it's the thing that gave us the artificial intentions that gave us Ultron, and it's the stone they used to power Vision. So an Infinity Stone is powering Vision, and he's uh, quite powerful because of that. At the end of the movie, Hulk takes off into space because he doesn't want to kill his new lady friend and feels that he's a threat to the Earth. So he goes off into space, which sets up Thor Ragnarok, as well as Thor's Hot Top Adventure, sets him once again also on an adventure to figure out all what was going on with that that sets up. Thor Ragnarok as well. The movie's last scene, it establishes a new Avengers base where our new set of Avengers are going to be trained. And so you've got a uh, War Machine, Falcon, and Wanda in there being trained. Then we get a post credit sequence where Thanos, frustrated by things going on, puts a gauntlet on and he says he's going to go into action himself to try and track down the Infinity Zones. Of course, setting up Infinity War coming out in just a couple of months or like six weeks, which is crazy to think about and sprinkled all throughout this entire movie is the differences between Steve and Tony, where Tony wants to stop being Mr. Superhero Guy. He wants to put some sort of army force in place that can save the world, whereas Steve absolutely does not believe in things like that, does not believe in someone trying to stop a war before it's going to happen. And because of this, this establishes very much so the tension leading up into the next movie. So those are the ones I caught. There's so many more. <laughs> you can't reference all of them. So tell me down below in the comment section if you get a good one that I missed, I will pin it up at the top of the page. With that said, here's what some of you guys had to say about Avengers Age of Ultron. This is shared over using the Stardust app. I'll tell you how you can get that at the end of this video so avengers age of ultron is very good movie i think it's uh like much better than people say it is i liked avengers age of ultron i didn't necessarily love it and it was really easy to enjoy avengers age of ultron is a really good movie not as good as the first one but still really great ultron was good he was wasted in the movie but still this is a good sequel Okay, so this one was really disappointing, uh, mainly because of Ultron. He's supposed to be one of the most powerful villains in all of Marvel Comics, and they just kind of nerfed him, I guess, and he was kind of annoying. I like the first Avengers better, but I think this was a really good movie. Uh, Ultron wasn't as menacing as he looked as in the trailer, but he was an okay villain. He was a bit cheesy, but... They shouldn't have killed Quicksilver. That kind of ruined it a little bit, too. Uh, this one is very entertaining. Uh, we have the Hulkbuster, uh, really amazing, but it lacks from the element of surprise that the first Avengers had. I think that Avengers Age of Ultron is underappreciated by fans of the MCU. It's literally basically the complete setup to Infinity War and what is going to come in the near future. This is a better than first one to me. He's one of my favorite villains in the MCU, and yeah, I really enjoyed him. Um, the villain, I think, is great. Um, James Spader is phenomenal as Ultron. Yes, it can sometimes have some really slow moments, but it's filled to the brim with pretty decent action, some nice character development, and overall, just a decent continuation to a film I adore. So there you have it. That's what some of you guys had to say about Avengers Age of Ultron. If you want to appear in a future video, it's really simple. All you have to do is download the Stardust app for your smartphone. You can get it at that link down below in the description. It's totally free. It doesn't cost anything. There's no ads or anything like that. But if you want to appear in a future video, real simple. Download the app, record your reaction to a movie that I'll be talking about in post reactions all the MCU movies that are coming up that are left in the series. Those are great examples of ones where you can share your reactions and very likely show up in a video. And then once you record your reaction, 
tag me in it. There's a little thing up in the right-hand corner where you can tag that, write Sean Chandler in there, and that'll make it happen. Download the app, follow me first, tag me in your reactions, and perhaps you can show up in a future video. So there you have it. There's my take on Avengers Age of Ultron, some of you guys' takes on it. I'd love to have a great discussion about it down below in the comment section. This one's pretty divisive. People have a lot of different thoughts on this one. And if you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews, TV reviews, ranking videos. But the key thing is I don't want to just talk about movies. I want to talk about movies with you. So join me down in the comment section. I really do read the comments, and I want to have as many lively, respectful conversations conversations as we can. And as always, thank you for watching.